Hello, I'm Richard Vobes, the Bald Explorer. This is a uh, continuation of my story and the story of Snug and Cozy, the children's television series that I had in the mid-1990s. And um, the, the story behind the scenes, really. Um, I think it's uh, it, it was a fascinating and interesting time for me where I learned about television. So if you uh, remember in the last episode, I was telling you really about the sort of um, the business side of how uh, this got together and uh, how the concept and the idea of this children's television program uh, came to me and, and the things that got in order to make this possible. I'd been interested, if you've been listening to uh, this series for any length of time, you've been, you know I was writing when I was in my uh, late teens um, children's television ideas and I had been up to uh, Yorkshire Television and they'd um, given me an insight into the television world and I've spoken about all of that. It's something that I ha felt I had an affinity with. I had been doing children's entertainment and things like that so uh, this was the logical next step. I was a great fan of Laurel and Hardy of course and this was in a way a tribute to them and to try and get kids to see something of old school humour in a way, I suppose. Uh, so we were Laurel and Hardy in spacesuits. And the concept uh, of the series, the slapstick children's television series, 10 minutes long episodes, was um, a very visual uh, Laurel and Hardy in spacesuits. These two uh, spacemen, snug and cosy, who uh, on holiday from their planet Squadge, heading off on an interstellar uh, holiday, just like many kids possibly would have done, uh, perhaps in this country or overseas, but in their space rocket, Snug and Cozy get knocked off course by a meteor, and they end up crashing on the Earth. And in, they, in the, the final TV series, they... Uh, are found by a little girl, 10 year old girl called Emily, and she hides them in the garden shed. In the original pilot that we made, uh, Snug and Cozy crash into a furniture shop. They adopt the name Snug and Cozy from the name of the furniture shop, and they end up in an allotment, which they think is the perfect place for holiday homes because the garden sheds look like the chalets that they had in the brochure of this planet in the, the other side of the galaxy. So that was, that was the overall concept. So I had um, built up around me a bunch of people who were, a lot of them were college students and were all interested in film. Um, and we started to work on this project. We, some of us had worked on the previous two projects, the tarmac film that I had made and the ghost film prior to that. And so this was something slightly different because it was children's television, it was a fictional thing, it was slapstick. And so we had a number of technical things that we wanted to achieve. There was the opening titles that I wanted in the pilot. I wanted the pilot to be a, a ready-made episode. It was a, it was a test episode to show off the characters, to show off Nigel and myself, who was, Nigel was the, uh, the other character or the actor, the other actor of, he was cozy, I was snug. And we wanted to show off us as the stars and our um, acting style and the fact that we would be the right people to play the parts. And also we wanted to show off that our production company would be the right production company to make this series and that we, we could do it. We wanted to prove all of those things. So we needed, um, we needed a title sequence which would have a rocket taking up taking off from the planet Squatch, going uh, through space, being knocked off course by an asteroid and, and then heading, crashing down on the Earth. And within this 20 second opening title sequence, it would explain the setup that the aliens are on holiday, they get, they get crashed and they're on Earth for a bit of fun. And that was really the, the element of that. Now, in order to do all of this, I felt it was necessary, and this is <laughs> quite laughable really in retrospect, that we would uh, need an office, a nice office, because I thought the executives would be interested in coming down to um, assess 
whether we were a pucker company or not. And, you know, you couldn't really invite them to your home. And I wanted the production company. Uh, I mean, I wanted the production of the program. That was the, one of the reasons why I had the sleeping partner, Joyce, who'd put the money in uh, to help Phil, who had sort of said, yes, he'll get involved in the company if it was to further his career and make something happen. And I said, this is why I was going to do the children's program. So I had to um, try and uh, woo the TV companies to say, yeah, well, the production company's ours, so that we all could then be working on the, the, the production of the program, as well as Nigel and I appearing as the, um, the stars of the programs, if you see, if all of that makes sense. So I was trying to honour all the different agreements. And you'll see how later on in this story uh, that all fell apart. However, we did rent an office. It was a very nice office in, in Worthing. And funnily enough, it was a, it was a large room um, in uh, another filmmakers, or uh, they, they made videos for uh, commercials. Uh, not big commercials, but small commercials at, at cinemas and um, some corporate stuff. I wasn't interested in, in any of that at the time, not really. Um, we were interested in making the, t the kids TV series. So we took on this office and we put some of the money that we had towards its rent. And it was very plush. But in that, in that office space, we also filmed part of the opening sequence with models that we'd made or had made. We'd made some asteroids. We made a rocket. We, there's a sequence right at the beginning with a rocket taking off. And actually, that's something I filmed on a, a roll of a canister a film canister, um, car, the, 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 what do you call it? The canister that film comes in, a spool canister. And it's sitting on one of those um, with a couple of um, homemade little towers either side of the rocket and the rocket takes off. We had a smoke machine that blasted some smoke and actually there was no real clever mechanics in any of this. I am actually holding the rocket. We turn the camera on, the smoke billows out, and then I just lift the rocket up like this, but my hand is hidden by the smoke and behind the uh, rocket, and it takes off. That little sequence, part of that sequence, was used in the final production. Uh, so uh, that's uh, just amazing, really, that they, that they deemed it good enough. We also had a contact who worked in Soho on a Rostrum camera for big movie productions who took our rocket that we'd had made, which was really a turned piece of um, dowel, a very thick piece of dowel that was shaped. And then we'd made the wings on this 1940s style rocket. And they took that on a rostrum camera and did some flying through space sequences, hitting uh, the, uh, the asteroids, which were, I think, lumps of foam that had been roughly painted. Anyway, it looked brilliant at the end of it. I mean, it, it looked really brilliant. So we filmed some of that in the studio. Some of that was done else, elsewhere as a favour and um, we filmed on an allotment mostly where this was happening and funnily enough one of um, my friends and colleagues of of the bald explorer who's been on the bald explorer shows in the past richard suggett who has the veg grower podcast he now has his allotment on the same site that we filmed many many years earlier um, with our sun and cozy series in which we put built a, a shed which was going to collapse um, we had a, a whole load of um, mushroom dung, which was important in the plot because Snug and Cozy end up buried in it, um, me with a big mouthful full of it. We had, uh, I mentioned, I think, in the last episode about Sammy's or Samuelson Lighting, a professional film lighting company who said they would provide all the uh, lights for nothing. We just had to pay £150 for one man to come on a night shoot and operate some of the lights. And on that night shoot, which was the end sequence to this pilot, which I'm sorry, I can't really show you anything because it, I need to get it off a VHS tape and I don't have um, uh, a way of doing that at the moment. Um, he came along 
And on this night shoot, he came with this lorry with a great big generator in the back like you used to get in the, in the days of film. And these lights, which were winched up about 30 odd feet, massive. One, I think, was a 20 kilowatt light and we had two 10 kilowatt lights. And we, we filmed all the stuff that we did. And I was going around as the director going, wait a minute, OK, so this is going to have to be shot at F4 on the 500 ASA film stock that we were using, which was again, these end, um, the, what they call, what do they call them? End, uh, real ends, um, which we got from the BBC on 16 millimeter film. I mean, all, all I, I mean, I was in my element. I'm dressed up in a, in a spaceman's outfit, trying to go around taking light meters to um, tell the camera operator exactly what the exposure should be right you had to get it right there was there was uh, no room for error and amazingly we all did we had a, a garage in Tangmere which we rented and it was a very long and thin garage in which we had uh, built a set for the interior of the spaceship um, so that the opening titles could just have a couple of shots of snug and cosy driving this thing through space. Um, we also had in there the interior of a garden shed in which a whole sequence of uh, craziness went on with an exploding wood burning stove and some comedy slapstick which we'd, we'd worked out. And then we also had a flatbed um, truck that we hired because part of the storyline had the shed that we were in being taken away from the allotment and we were fighting to get it back and we'd clambered aboard on this lorry as it was going down the road and um, I, I think we hijacked the uh, we hijacked the the lorry and I'm trying to rescue the uh, the shed and being dragged along and, and falling about on this lorry whilst it's, uh, whilst it's going. So it was a whole load of stunts. I wanted to get over the fact that we were slapstick, uh, that we could do stunts, that unlike the Chuckle Brothers who were on at the time, any time they fell over, they would fall off screen. They would go, oh, and then fall off screen, and then you'd cut to them on the ground because they were quite elderly people. But we wanted to show that we weren't scared of actually doing the stunts. We would be dragged along by things. We would, we, would, we would actually do them. And in the final scripts that I wrote for the series, there was lots of that sort of stuff going on that we had to curb because um, health and safety apparently wouldn't let us do it. Didn't stop us in the pilot, I can tell you. Anyway, we made the pilot. There was a whole technical rigmarole, which I won't bore you with, about how you edit 16 millimeter stuff in the old fashioned on film uh, with all the layers of audio that we had, which was all on something called mag, which was film like tape but with sprockets in it, which you'd have in a, an audio gang uh, machine. So you could a, a pick sync. So you could sync up the picture with all the different tracks of audio, which might be um, atmospheric sounds, uh, the the gobbledygook that we spoke, and um, a folio of just the costumes rustling as we moved. We tried to recreate all the sound because we'd shot the thing uh, mute when we were filming. So we had to reproduce every bit of sound. Anyway. We got all that done. We went down to Meridian TV station with our rolls of uh, t uh, film and our rolls of audio. And we had it all mixed professionally. And ultimately, the whole lot was sent to a laboratory who made a master print. And from that master print, we had the VHS tapes back then in 1994 made. And they were sent to the television stations with our pilot. Uh, on it. A whole load of hard work by a lot of very good, talented people um, all came together on that pilot. And we sent them off and very quickly two or three of those came back. No thanks, that's not for us, thanks for sending it. And uh, I can't tell you how disappointed uh, we were, obviously. Um, but not all of them came back. So we'd sent them to uh, many of the ITV stations, Yorkshire Television, Scottish Television, the BBC, Meridian, Anglia TV, anybody who made children's television. And a few of them came back quite quickly 
Uh, and then we started to get the tickle. We had an inquiry from Scottish Television and one from Granada. And they were both interested in seeing us to talk about the programme. So we were very elated. We realised we had two and, you know, they wanted us. So it was great. The first one that we went to see was a chap called Edward Pugh in Manchester at Granada Television. I think it, now I always get this memory quite sh sure because I think Ed Pugh went to work on at the BBC, but I'm sure it wasn't the BBC who uh, asked us. I'm sure it was Granada, but um, I get a bit confused on that. But, and I'm sure Nigel, if he's watching, will be able to perhaps remember better. But I know we went to see Ed Pugh in Manchester. We, we drove up the night before. We stayed in this very dodgy hotel, I seem to remember, in Bury. Um, and then we went to Granada Studios and we saw Ed Pugh. And he was, in, I mean, he was a very affable, nice chap. But the interview was very strange. We'd gone in, we thought that they wanted us and they were interested. But it was just like we, you were having an interview for a job. He was very subdued and it was just this sort of little uh, asking us very basic question. Well, what is your name and what is your background and have you done anything like this before? And it was all this sort of very, very boring interview with no inspiration, no enthusiasm for the programme. No, as I seem to remember it, no questions about how we would make the programme in the future and what our aspirations was. It was it was a very uninspiring interview. Then later on, we had the interview with Scottish Television, who also would make this, if it happened, and put it onto the ITV network up and down the country. They had offices in London, so we didn't have to go up to Scotland in Glasgow, where they're based. So we went to see them at Lincoln's Inn Fields in London at the studio. Um, and they had a studio and, uh, and offices there. And uh, we went to see a chap called Sandy Ross and we went in and it was, they were so welcoming. They were very welcoming. Come on in. Um, yeah, what, whatever. We spoke about it. They loved it. They were talking about lots of potential for it. And they were, one of the things that really decided it for us is they were saying, listen, if you come with us, because we said that Granada were interested and they said, well, if you come with us, we, we want to sell this around the world because you talk in this gobbledygook. We think we can sell this around the world and you will get 50 percent of the sales um, budget, uh, the 50 uh, percent of um, the sales of it around the world. And also you'll get 50 percent of any production budget if there's any money left over. So if, if, if we have £100,000 from ITV to make this, but actually we only make it for 50, and therefore there's 50 grand um, surplus, we will split that 50-50. And I was thinking that's fantastic because that 25 grand then would go towards um, developing new programs and making new pilots and furthering Nigel and our, our career, but also would help pay for Joyce and Phil and all the other people who had made the pilot. And, and that would be fantastic. You know, this was, this was where I wanted to honour um, the, the people who had helped. And uh, so that was all in, that was all in the thing. So we decided, well, without question, we're going to go with Scottish television. Um, they, we seem to have this great rapport and it was good. How, and then I started to get to deal with the lawyers. And uh, now we, I didn't have any expensive lawyers. I think we managed to find somebody who would just cross the T's and dot the I's um, for a small fee. But uh, we didn't have the million dollar uh, lawyers that the Scottish television had. And we kept getting these bits of paper and I was reading through it and going, wait a minute, where's this worldwide sales bit that we were supposed to have 50% of? And, and where's the production budget thing that we were supposed to have? And I think there was a couple of other things. And I was saying to Nigel, I said, that all the things they've promised are not there. And he said, well, you know, it's a bit tricky, isn't it? We, we, but we don't want to rock the boat. We want to get the gig, don't we? And I said, yeah, we, we do want to get the gig. But at the same time, this is our first foray into television. We, we need to, you know, they want us, remember, we're in a strong position. Well, this argy-bargy went on a bit because they kept saying, no, we didn't. We didn't offer you these things. And I said, 
Well, you did, but of course we had no, it was a verbal agreement. There was no, he, it was he said, she said situation. There was no uh, audio of it. There was no record of it, but, but Nigel and I both knew that's what they had offered because we heard it and we said, we, they did say this, didn't they? Yes, yes, we were questioning ourselves. Um, this went on. In the meantime, the production, the, the, the ITV network had agreed to have it, this program, and a, a set was being made. We'd gone up and rehearsed. We'd seen the rehearsals. I'll tell you all about that in a different episode of this because I'd, um, we're going to have to finish off now. But um, it got to this point where we were a day before the first day of principal photography. In other words, the first day before we started shooting and the contract was not signed because I had not signed the contract because I kept questioning where, where's the bits that you promised. And ultimately I was summoned to see Sandy Ross in his office at Scottish Television the day before we were filming. And he said, you, you st I notice you haven't signed the contract. And I, I said again, but the things that we, you promised us are not in it. And he just turned around to me quite cynically and just said, do you want to be in television or don't you? And although Nigel said, don't rock the boat, don't rock the boat, I realized that that was exactly how cutthroat the business was. And so I signed the contract, signed away all the things that were promised and all of that. Our experience was not great with that company. And um, I'll tell you more about uh, that um, in the next episode of this story. So thank you very much for watching. I hope it's been interesting. It, uh, it gets more interesting as it goes on. Um, and it just goes to show how naive I was entering into the big grown-up world of television and how where my concept of passion and making things right goes against the big world of corporation and money. And uh, I'll tell you about that next time. Thank you so much for watching. Take care. Bye-bye for now.